All right, it looks like they're ready, so um, we'll get started with this. First of all, good morning. My name is Joe DeLuca. Thanks for coming to the web conference. I'm on the, uh, the planning committee this year for the programming track. Reminders, um, turn your cell phones up as loud as you can so that they ring for everybody to hear. <laughs> I just feel so stupid still saying that after all these years. I guess we do. Turn your smartphones off. Um, don't forget the evaluation form. Um, yeah, session code is up there. You're never going to remember that. But if you still have this piece of paper, the session code is on there. Okay, so it's G2 for this one. So you'll need that whenever you fill out the evaluation. So that's enough for me. Um, this program is called, I don't want to get the full title, Optimizing Web, web Performance, The Becoming Device Apocalypse. Please welcome Dave Olson. Thank you, Joe. I obviously couldn't fit all of that on my title slide, so I miss it. So, um, this deck is chock full of links and notes and all sorts of stuff. Um, don't worry about trying to write it all down. This deck, uh, in its previous incarnations, is already on uh, SlideShare at slideshare.net slash dmolsonwvu. So, you can just go there, follow along, or whatever you want to do. Um, so, hopefully, that saves you some trouble as I run through this content and there's a lot of it. So again my name is Dave Olson. For the last 10 years I've worked at West Virginia University. Um, I'm kind of a full stack dev so I do server side stuff, database stuff, programming, front end development, jack of all trades. If you can name it I've had to do it. Um, I've done a bunch of open source projects like mobile web OSP, um, detector, throttle and currently I'm working with Brad Frost on Pattern Lab and having a lot of fun with that. So. And I contributed to a book, Smashing Mags, the mobile book, last year, where I wrote a chapter on web performance for them. Uh, and this is actually a door prize here, so make sure you stick around until the end. It's a lovely book with uh, great chapters from Peter Paul Co Coach, uh, Stephanie Rieger, Brad Frost, Trent Walton, and a whole host of great people. So what I will talk about today, I'll do a quick intro about why you should be caring about web performance. Um, and then we'll talk about tools for measuring web performance. And then finally, we'll talk about how you can set up a device lab at your institution or your department and how actually cheap that is, relatively cheap that is. So why should we care about web performance, like Care Bears? Uh, so this is actually a slide from Brad Frost. I ripped them off. Um, and so when we think about responsive web design, it's really easy to think about it's just this little bit. We just talk about this like topic and responsive web design is so cool. And Jason Grigsby really summed up the problem with this, thinking about just this little bit. He said, the way in which CSS media queries have been promoted for mobile hides tough problems and gives developers a false promise of simple solutions for design for small screens. Basically what he's saying is responsive web design is sold as you add a media query, your website is mobile friendly. And that's not nearly the truth. The truth of the matter is you have to think about a whole host of other things as you add media queries to make your content and your websites the best they can be. Adding feature detection, does this browser support stuff? Um, responsive web design, what APIs are actually available on separate devices? Content strategy, which is a big thing, you're gonna learn way more about it tomorrow and you're really lucky you get to hear Karen talk. Uh, what touch means, using a meat stick to touch things. And finally, for me, I, th I think the really big issue is performance and trying to make sure our websites are usable everywhere and anywhere for anyone. So 1.3 megs, this is the average web weight of a web page today, or a home page, as chalked up by the HTTP archive. 77% of that weight is simply images and JavaScript. It's like two years ago, we were around 700K. Three years ago, I think we were at no, three years ago or 700K, it's doubled in three years. I just announced that today. So um, we're getting bigger and heavier and more issues. And if all you did was add a media query to this 1.3 meg website and make it mobile friendly, you're still delivering this amazingly huge website over crappy networks. Um, so again, there's much more to think about than just a media query. And this kind of plays out. 72% of responsive web design sites their small screen design weighs the exact same as their desktop design. No one's really thought about how to optimize and make those small screen 
experience is better for those people. I think this number has fluctuated a tiny bit, but not by a whole lot. Um, and the other issue that we face is that 71% of our users expect our mobile site to load as quickly as the desktop site. Even though you're on a crappier network, worse browser possibly, um, we're still trying to deliver the same amount of information in the same amount of time, which isn't possible. And there was actually a case study done. Um, Strange Loop was actually the company that did the case study with a client of theirs. Um, and they just found how conversion rates changed based on simple things like how slow a network was is, and which is something that really affects uh, mobile. And so basically, if you slow down the web, delivering the website by a second, just one second, they saw a bounce rate, their bounce rate increased 8.3%. So one in 10 people left the website just because of the website took one more second to load than it normally did. Um, and they lost you know, 3.5% in sales. That's one second. Um, and that's not a whole lot when you think about adding latency to all the websites because of mobile. So as you think about designing mobile first, responsive web design, all that kind of great stuff, we have to think about performance first. And that has to drive basically every decision that you make during the process. It starts right at the beginning when you take in requirements with a project, when you're explaining to a client what you have to do, um, what you're thinking about when you're doing design. Um, performance is not something you just simply tag on at the end and go, I handed it off, we're ready to deploy, let's add all the performance tweaks and we're ready to go. It does not work like that. You can get some of the way there, but definitely not all the way there. So what are the primary performance issues for responsive web design? What are the things we have to keep in mind as we, or what are the, the things in responsive web design that are gonna kind of butt us in the ass? So uh, on one bucket, we have this idea of over-downloading. So the fun thing to do with responsive web design, we have uh, a div with some images in it. it. Doesn't really quite fit in a 320 pixel. We'll say it, display none, fantastic, it's gone. The user can't see it, makes everything great. The problem is the browser's still parsing that document, they're still downloading those images, still causing you issues. Display none is horrible. Do not use it as a solution for your content needs. Uh, find other ways to do stuff. So, download size one problem. Download and shrink is another issue. We have the wonderful carousel, or the wonderful big hero image on the website, right? Look at this big splash image. And we're gonna do it, make it mobile friendly. We go, everything's gonna be 100% by 100%, right? So you can with it and everything. But we wanna deliver one image to everybody. And so we're gonna deliver an image that looks good for desktops. So this is really big 960 by 480 image. But on mobile, we're gonna squish it down to 320 pixels by whatever the math is. Um, I'm not gonna do it. Um, but you're still delivering the same number of bytes and pixels, you're just squishing it. So you're kind of over delivering to the mobile side. Uh, and the other thing is the downloading NAR, which is mainly a JavaScript thing, where you're turning off a feature, again using maybe display none, where you're delivering a feature of JavaScript that's never actually used. And the flip side is the poor networks. Uh, high latency is the big, big issue on mobile. So latency, latency is the lag between the browser sending a request to the server and the server responding. So if you're on like a cable modem or your home high-speed connection, you've probably got a latency of 40 milliseconds, right, for the browser send a request and get it back. But if you're out on Verizon's 3G, 4G network, um, you're looking at 200 milliseconds for a single request. And that stuff starts tacking, stacking up the more requests you have in a page. So if you have like 80, 90 requests in a page, you think about, you're stacking up latency on all those requests. Um, you're losing a ton of time. And again, we go back to that one second that gets lost and 10% of people drop out. And that's pure latency, so nothing you can do about. So you wanna think about that um, variable bandwidth and packet loss. Because not everybody is on 4G. As somebody from rural West Virginia knows. I live on the edge. <laughs> Uh, every day. Um, so what things should we focus on as we, what steps can we take? So the big thing is to reduce requests, um, reduce asset size, and speed up page render. 
to optimize our performance. So I'm going to go through really quickly some general best practices you can do. Uh, the number one thing, the absolute number one thing, the easiest thing you guys can do uh, is make sure the server is setting the appropriate cache headers. Um, it's probably not something anybody in this room may necessarily be doing, but it's something you can check on and go talk to your server admins. So there's a wonderful website called redbot.org, which will tell you if your cache headers are set appropriately or not set appropriately. If they're not, go bug your sysadmin and say, do this. It's the absolute number one gain. If we're talking about reducing requests, basically what the cache headers say is, there's this file like jQuery that's never going to change, right? When I deployed the website, I use this version of jQuery, I'm always going to use it. We never need the browser to re-request that version of jQuery, adding a request to your website. Just try to make sure that stays on there for like a year. Um, so definitely look at how you can muck with the uh, browser cache. You know, think about concatenating JS and CSS. Lazy loading content is one of my favorite things right now, trying to lazy load images uh, based on viewport, right? So you don't load an image until it's actually in the viewport so somebody can see it on mobile. Um, and I'm, I wrote lazy block, so I really like lazy block. It's about loading uh, blocks of content lazily. So trying to avoid that display non-issue. Uh, data URI, if you're doing it for like small images, is always good, and then conditional loading. So it's some ways to think about reducing requests. And really, I don't think Ilya actually said this. I think in the, I found out that it's Steve Souders who said the best request is no request, and the worst request is one that blocks the parser. So basically, do everything in your power to not have a request. So think about using CSS gradients instead of having an image gradient, that kind of thing. Um, I would add the corollary that the second best request is the one that um, doesn't get parsed by the browser, which is an idea of hiding content markup from the parser. So something like lazy block or um, commenting out JavaScript and only uncommenting it when you actually need it. So it has it, but the browser didn't spend time parsing it. So things to think about for reducing asset size, image compression is, again, the number one easiest thing you can do. So rather than in Photoshop, say for the web, going 70% for everything because it's got to look amazing, um, think about just doing it at 40% and see if that still works. That will probably end up cutting half your image size, dropping that a little bit. Um, and seriously, look at it and see if you can notice a difference. If you can't, it's a hell of a lot better. Again, try to avoid images, minification. I would argue trying to avoid bulky frameworks uh, like jQuery. Though jQuery 2 is better because it's now more modular. Um, but think about trying to look at microjs.com, which has a bunch of little libraries that do Single things very well, so it's really small. Um, do things and maybe learn vanilla JS if you haven't learned basic JavaScript. So selectors, you can do that in vanilla JS with a line instead of loading up a 90K library. And then uh, the flip side to performance, this isn't all like delivering X number of bytes to a client. It's also how well does your website perform in the browser itself like scrolling and animation and all that kind of stuff. That's the other side for performance. Um, so trying to avoid DOM reflows and repaints, which is basically like how do you access the DOM to change styles with CSS. Sorry, I don't have a really good example of that, but um, Google it and you'll find some stuff. I'll show you some tips and techniques later to discover where you have issues. Touch beats on click. So if you have a lot of on click handlers, think about swapping that out for touch events on mobile devices that support touch, you're going to gain 300 milliseconds there. Because on uh, like your iPhone, it delays 300 milliseconds waiting for a second touch. And avoid uh, social media widgets. If you don't need them, don't include them. They're a huge, huge performance suck. So with those kind of ideas in mind, like these general best practices, what kind of tools can you look at to help you in your workflow and process to actually make things happen. So I split these up into two buckets. The first is diagnostic tools, the tools that will help you find the problems. And the other thing is the automated tools, which hopefully you can just deploy and make everything magic. So we'll talk about diagnostic tools first. And the first diagnostic tool, and the easiest one to use, is the inspector. And we're going to go through Chrome's inspector. but 
know this thing inside and out. It will help you everywhere and anywhere. And so we're going to go through the inspe a bit of the inspector today. Try to figure it out. Uh, Ilya Grigorik, I think I've already mentioned him like five times. Uh, he is amazing, by the way, with web performance. It's his entire job for Google. Uh, did a fantastic presentation that goes into way more depth than I provide here in this talk uh, called DevTools Can Do That. It shows you everything that Chrome DevTools can do, um, which is a hell of a lot. And did my machine just start? No. I've never had that happen before. We're back? Okay. So um, if you have a laptop and you can actually get Wi-Fi, which doesn't look like anybody has a wi uh, laptop on. If you're at home on the inner tubes, uh, you can open up developer tools in Chrome and check out your website and see if you can uh, see how your website performs as you look through these features. So the first thing you want to do when you open up Web Inspector and you're going to go test, test for the day, test for the morning, whatever it's going to be, is disable cache. This will save yourself a ton of headaches. You always get a true view of what that first time user is going to experience when they visit your website. So the first thing you want to do is disable cache. There's a little gear icon on the uh, developer tools. You click that, the up pops this. Just like the disable cache and you're good to go. The flip side is just make sure you uncheck that when you're done with the day <laughs> so that you get the best performance you can out of your, your websites. Um, so everyone is probably, or most people are probably fairly familiar with the elements panel. And the elements panel is where you're looking at markup and you're changing styles and you're checking all that kind of fun stuff out and seeing where elements are laying out. But there's a hell of a lot more to the inspector and you really, again, should get into and learn to love it. So we're going to look at the network panel. And the network panel basically shows what's called a waterfall. It shows you every request that the browser made to get the assets for your web page. And it shows you the order in which it requested them and then how long each thing took and all that kind of good stuff. And so the first thing you want to learn, figure out is what's the biggest asset that I'm trying to deliver to my client? And what you can do is you can click on the size tab and reorder that. And it'll reorder in the biggest, the images that are the biggest, or they tend to be images, but the files that are the biggest. You can start figuring out maybe that's an area where I want to tweak and recompress the image and see if I can make it that much smaller. Um, cut out, maybe it's JavaScript, cut out that JavaScript if I don't really need it. Um, the other thing is it will show you the transfer size. So if compression is turned on on your server, it will show you how much was actually transferred over the wire versus the actual size of the file itself. So those two differences is. Um, again, latency is a big problem. So if you're looking at a website and you want to look at maybe what the latency is for it, um, you can again look at how long a document took to download, what was added onto that download time just in terms of pure latency. And you're going to notice this is like multiple seconds to get files. I was at home on my rural DSL listening to Spotify for a really slow connection. So that's why it's 7.33 seconds of latency. It's pretty crazy. Um, and then the other thing you can look at is basically like how long did it take for the page to render for the end user to have a usable final product, right? So the first blue line is DOM content loaded. So that's like jQuery's on ready when the DOM is finished loading. And then the final event is the onload event, which is when the user is, everything's completely done. They can start moving around and have everything cleared out. The in-between part is where the, the page is kind of going jaggedy and moving things around and reflows and repaints are kind of going on. Um, so the goal of looking at all this, oh, whoops, sorry, one more slide. So explaining uh, the network panel, you've, you've made some tweaks and you got a performance report, right? And you want to save it so you can look at other tweaks in the future and see how they all compare. You can actually save kind of a snapshot of the things you're looking at. It's called a HAR file or HTTP archive file. And if you save it, it downloads as a nice little document. There are services online where you can upload it and then it can see over time how your performance has changed or not changed based on tweaks you're making. 
So you can actually get snapshots of this stuff. This doesn't, doesn't have to go into the ether after you're done. You can actually uh, capture all that data. It's really good data to collect if you're into that kind of thing. So the goal of looking at the network panel, like what you're trying to make happen at the end of the day, is to get a narrower waterfall. So meaning we want a shorter time between DOM content loaded and on load event. So that means the page is that much is available that much faster to the end user. And then we want a shorter waterfall, which means less requests have been made to actually get your page loaded. So you know, if you have 90 requests, you want to get down to like hopefully 40 or something less. Um, so yeah, when you're looking at the network panel, that is your goal. How can you figure out how to make it narrower, so a faster page render, and then shorter, less requests? And the other thing you should want to do, because we're talking responsive design, is test what I would call the squishy, right? So at each breakpoint that you have in your design, make sure you test and run that to see if any files are being downloaded or not being downloaded. Hopefully, when you're doing responsive design, you're using min width versus max width in your media queries. That's really important. Um, so that way, assets are only loaded for their appropriate screen. Min width is where it's at. So definitely test the squishy. One thing that we've been doing to kind of help prep us to, to make our testing go easier is we've been developing performance budgets for our projects. So we get a request from the client that says, hey, we want to do X, Y, and Z, this website. We kind of give ourselves internally a budget of X number of K, maybe how many um, requests we want to make, and maybe you can go page render time. We've never, we haven't gone page render time yet, but you can actually set up a budget to say, this website should render in two seconds. It can never take longer than two seconds to render, or it can never have more than 100K, have no more than this number of requests. Now, that's not to say that you can't go over those numbers, but it gives you a handy tool to kind of help limit yourself and limit features and make sure you're gonna be performant no matter what. Uh, so a good example, two, two examples. Um, so for our new emergency website, we have a 50K budget for the web, the home, that page to load, right? So that made sure that we cut out a whole host of things and we're making it as slim and tidy as possible. Uh, so that way in the case of an emergency, we're gonna be able to deliver a fast website um, with little overhead and should make everything really available. That's the other thing, if you have a small website, um, you're going to end up using less resources both in bandwidth and on your server to deliver assets. So it works out for everybody. Um, and then another good example is for my personal website, I set a goal of 50K and I busted that because I really liked web fonts. So I went to 100K, which isn't much, but still. Um, so you definitely can uh, look at performance tweaks as compromises and find other reasons to kind of use things. It just helps you understand kind of what your trade-offs are in including any, fe any particular feature. Okay, so we've talked about the network panel. For the programmers, we're gonna be doing JavaScript and stuff like that. Timeline panel can be invaluable. Uh, I'm not gonna go in too much detail because it's pretty insane, but the timeline panel basically will tell you what the browser is doing at any given second. So it's rendering CSS, it's, um, sending a request to the server, receiving a request to the server, how long a repaint took, how your animations are performing. So um, it will actually, I don't have it, I don't have a screenshot of it, but it'll actually tell you how your frame rate is performing. FPS, like playing a game. You always wanna be like 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second. So if you're getting anything, any janky um, animations, this is the place to go look to see maybe what the issue is. See if you can figure out how to make your animations that much smoother. Another good tool for the CS, uh, designer folks is to look at how your CSS selectors are performing, the performing well or not. So under the profiles panel, there is this uh, collect CSS selector profile. So you check it, you reload your website, and it gives you a report like this, which lists out every selector that was attempted out of your CSS. And you can figure out where you have duplicate selectors, for performing selectors, like where you're selecting star, we're gonna select everything and try to apply styles to it. Um, and you can see our designer 
duplicate it a lot, he liked to add, rather than adding attributes to selectors that already existed, he just wanted to recreate selectors. Um, and it will also show you all the selectors in your CSS that aren't matching anything. So the browser's trying to run those selectors, but they don't match anything. So you're running them for no reason. So you try to figure out where you're getting good performance or not. And then finally, and maybe I could have told you this earlier, but there is this wonderful audits panel. But it's not amazing, but it's pretty good. And what the audits panel do is it'll give you a really quick overview of the performance issues that your website has. And it'll give you a little blurb about how you might want to fix it. Not very much. But at least it's a, it's a start, right? Even better, though, since we're in Chrome, is to use the PageSpeed Insights extension, which is essentially that audit panel on steroids. And it links out to a website, so it's always updated. The audit panel is just whatever came with that install of Chrome. So as new versions of Chrome come out, that audit won't be updated or new features are added. So this will give you a heck of a lot more information about the things that you can tweak or fix for a particular website uh, and give you links out to websites to teach you more about how to address those issues. So maybe you're looking at an existing website. How, what things can I quickly do? So for us, lever bra leverage browser caching, that kind of stuff. If we're talking about mobile, Chrome for Android, uh, Opera with Dragonfly, and now iOS 6 all support remote debugging. So you can look at essentially network panel sort of stuff for a mobile browser and see, because this is now looking at like the actual CPU and the RAM and stuff like that. So maybe. On desktop, that animation isn't janky, but it's janky here. You can actually look at that timeline panel and figure out what the issue may be. Uh, if you're interested, because I've been take, talking mainly about Chrome, Safari, WebKit kind of stuff, which is you know, blink now. Um, if you're interested in IE and Firefox and testing those, I'd recommend uh, HTTP Watch. It does cost a little bit of money, but it is a way of testing and validating those browsers as well. And then kind of going forward, yes, you've launched the site. And, you know, you've done all this performance monitoring or performance testing before you launched. Now you've launched it. Now how is it actually performing in the real world? Where are real users, where are they experiencing? If your website is using Google Analytics, and pretty much everybody should be using Google Analytics, there's a handy report called um, site speed, which will tell you performance characteristics of people visiting your website, so how long it's taking to download, what network they have. And the beauty is all those, all the ways you would slice and dice any other bit of Google Analytics data, you're able to slice and dice site speed data. So maybe you already have custom, um, I'm blanking on the name, custom reports and kind of stuff set up. You can slice and dice this data the same way. Like, how's it performing for internal clients versus external clients? For this state versus that state, that kind of stuff. Um, for me, this is really good. I think performance is one of the next, next ways that we can actually tweak things like admissions and prospective students' websites to make things that much better. Because if you're getting to your website faster, getting your website to load that much faster, they're going to be that much happier with your school and be happier with you. So uh, I do think. This is something you should actually be looking at for those kind of websites. So we've been talking a lot about local testing, right, on your machine with Chrome and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but how do you see, other than Google Analytics site speed after you've launched a website, how a website might perform from off campus or from wherever? Um, and so there are two, two really good tools. Actually, I, I prefer the one on the left. Uh, the one on the left is web page test. And basically, it lets you test your website from anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world. And it gives you, again, that sort of uh, audit review. It tells you like what you should fix or not fix. And um, it does a couple other things, and we'll go through them in a minute. So Andy Davies and Aaron Peters gave uh, what was actually considered, I guess, one of the top 10 talks last year called Web Page Test Beyond the Basics. It's a fantastic slide deck that goes into a ton of detail about what you can do with Web Page Test. I'm gonna, I've taken out a couple of the big ones. The first one is how can you capture events after onload? So things like carousels that might be running after your onload event, how can you get the performance characteristics of that? 
um, there is actually ability um, to modify how long web page tests record your website for. So if you know 15 seconds into your website, there may be an issue, you're, you can set that up to record that way. Uh, web page tests will help you test the performance if a third party service drops out, right? So if Facebook dies for a day, what's gonna happen to your website? How can you work around it? So they have this thing called uh, SPOF, which lets you essentially black hole requests and see what happens. And if you've never seen what happens, it's kind of fun to try it out and see how your website just kind of dies. Um, and you can figure out how you can reorder things, scripts, to, so most of your content loads. And yes, that the Facebook widget has died, but your content's still available. Uh, the other thing is, is you can uh, script, script out um, web page tests. So in this example, which you probably can't really see very well, it says that um, basically go to a particular website, set your viewport to 320 by 480, and show me the report. So this is basically mimicking what would be a mobile browser. Uh, so it's an easy way of, of quickly mimicking that. And the really cool thing that I love is it'll capture screenshots. So as you tweak performances, you can see how your page renders better based on tweaks. So this is showing that um, in our original, it was taking uh, between 1.3 and 1.4 seconds for anything to show up to the client in this particular test, right? They waited 1.3 seconds just to get anything to show up on their screen. And we tweaked some stuff and it ended up loading much faster, which you can actually see in this way. So it's a good way of recording that data um, and visually seeing how page render is happening or not happening. And this is another case of, of looking at that with that, um, whatchamacallit, where we programmatically set in the viewport. Again, it shows you uh, how it loaded or didn't load. Another good mobile performance tool is the mobile bookmark Barklet for uh, Steve Souders. And we're, if latency and network are such a big issue and we're only testing on mobile devices and web page test gives you a little bit, are there other ways locally to kind of change your network characteristics to see how a website performs? And you have two options. Uh, the one on the left is called Charles, Charles Proxy. Um, you can set that up locally on a machine and it will, you can traffic shape requests to your website, local website or not. Uh, we built Throttle in-house. It was my first taste of Node, Node.js, to try to figure out how I could use that and sort of loosely based on Shim.js. Um, and so that's a, a free version to try to figure out how you can shape traffic. And uh, Jason Grigsby did a really good write-up about how to use Charles Proxy. Now, the, the article's about how you use it to examine iOS, but it, there are instructions that will work for anything. Another thing to do is test and optimize your JavaScript with uh, JS Perf. Um, it takes a little bit to get used to, but if you want to see how you can optimize JavaScript, this is a good way of writing out different ways of doing kind of the same thing and then testing which way is the best. So this particular example is one that is sort of based on what I was trying to do with lazy block. Somebody actually rewrote my lazy block tests in a much better way. And so we, you end up getting like what the performance is for any of those four tests on a particular browser. So then you get to decide like, we should use this solution because it's definitely the fastest. And then W3C's navigation timing, it's not really there yet in terms of being on every browser, but it's a, another way of maybe getting performance data out of uh, your requests. So those are diagnostic tools that you have to kind of manually do stuff. Is there any automated tools that you can use? Uh, and there is. This is by far the best one, um, Mod PageSpeed from Google. It's an Apache module, you load it up, you walk away, and it's not gonna be perfect performance optimization for your website, but it's gonna be perfect. Um, by default, it comes out of the box with um, Combining your CSS files for you, converting JPEGs to progressive JPEGs, that's the hot thing now for uh, optimizing images. Convert your meta cache, does cache, flatten CSS. All this stuff it does for you. You never have to think about it. You just turn it on and it's done. Um, so you do your regular development the way you always would. Mm, upload the web pages as HTML, and it just, before it serves the request to the browser, it munges it all up and serves the 
real optimized version of your web page. Uh, so basically, if you can get your sysadmin to add it to your Apache stack, two thumbs up. We can't do that, but maybe you can take advantage of it. Um, if you're using CodeKit, you're already getting some web perf stuff, not a ton, but you get a little bit. It will optimize images for you. It will combine and minify for you. Um, so at least you're going to get something out of that tool. If you're not using SAS, seriously, learn it. Um, there's a talk tomorrow in the responsive web design track from the guys at Bearded, Patrick Fulton and um, Matt Griffin. They talk a little bit about SAS and how you can use it. So if you're not familiar, recommend checking it out. A little plug for my track, I guess. So we've talked about why I should care about performance. We've talked about some tools that you can use to test performance, both locally and then hopefully automate it a little bit. Um, by the end of the day, as much as you can do stuff on your desktop machine, you're still going to want devices in your hand, especially when you're dealing with touch. You need to know. It's just not something you can, you can simulate. You have to be able to touch it yourself and see how your finger interacts and reacts with things. So how do you get devices? Or sort of how do you get devices, where you, where you can start. So you can start with um, what we use a lot, or at least we start using a lot, it's called Browser Stack. And basically, it's an online service that gives you a VM and lets you emulate basically any browser, I won't say any browser on the planet, but basically everything. So if you want to test IE7 and IE8, IE9, IE10, and not set up local VMs or have local computers that have these separate versions because it's such a pain in the ass, Browser Stack is where it's at. Um, cheap as all get out, it's like $25 a month. Just use it, we use it all the time. Emulators, I wouldn't really recommend using emulators. They're a pain in the ass to set up, but you can use it. Uh, the other thing with Browser Stack, it does have Android and iOS for emulating as well. But at the end of the day, you do have to get your, your hands on real devices. And there are four good ways of getting your hands on devices. First is eBay. Um, go on eBay, search phone, and you can buy a phone. Uh, maybe I'm just old school. I don't really trust eBay. It's shifty, shady characters there. They're probably all wonderful people. but um, We end up using mobilekarma.com, which is a service that um, essentially buys phones on the cheap from people and then refurbishes them and sells them to you. And it's a fantastic service for getting up and started. So I recommend them. You can also go to cell phone stores and see if they have leftovers. And they'll just sell you just the, the handset. Uh, that's the other thing to keep in mind. We're not talking about buying a handset plus a cell data plan. We're just getting a handset that has Wi-Fi. So you just turn on the Wi-Fi. You can unlock the phone. Um, cell phone store leftovers are good if you're probably in a real metro, like Philly or a, where they have a lot of turnover in devices. Um, I know in Morgantown, they basically had nothing for us. So um, I don't know if that's a useful option. And then finally, there's the open device labs which I'll get to in a second. So opendevicelab.com is a wonderful website. They were just nominated for a NetMag award. I don't believe they won. But basically what they do is they list out locations around the country where, or the world where you can walk in and test out your website on a free device. People have decided they're going to share the devices they have uh, in their departments or in their uh, companies for anyone to come in and use. And so if you go to opendevicelab.com, you can go and check out. I don't think there's any in central Pennsylvania, but maybe you're somebody who has a bunch of devices and you want to be a good, kind soul and open an open device lab. And you can add your stuff here and, and help everybody out. So how would you decide which devices would make sense? Like which one would you actually purchase? So uh, you can base, uh, the first thing to get is any device that's Wi-Fi capable. No point in getting anything that has a cell phone plan. Um, not worth it. Uh, look at your analytics rank. Uh, Google Analytics has a list of devices. Uh, OS, screen dimensions, and then finally cost. A suggested focus would be iPod Touch, which would get you Retina and iOS. Uh, Mid-level, maybe Android and high-end Android. So if you look at your stats, and Android 2.3 is still a big thing. You can get like a Samsung Fastinate. Um, and then maybe get uh, Google Nexus One, which would get you Android uh, 4, at least. 
And then I technically wouldn't recommend getting a tablet for a device lab. It's basically the same screen dimensions as a desktop. You're really going to find that you're not tweaking much for a tablet unless you're going to be spending, unless it's a service that you're going to be really designing hardcore for a tablet to be used all the time on a tablet. It's going to be used every day. Uh, at least for a responsive, I wouldn't worry about a tablet that much. And I wouldn't worry necessarily about BlackBerry or Windows Phone 7, though it is a good excuse to pick up devices that you just want to play with, which we've done. We bought, uh, yeah, we bought like a Palm Pre 2. We didn't need a Palm Pre 2, but I always wanted to see what it was like. So we got one. So an example starter kind of kit for a device lab, again, iPod Touch with Retina, Samsung Fascinate, which would get you lower level of Android, and a Google Nexus One, which would get you the latest, greatest Android, would cost you $537. And that is probably going to be like 90% of your mobile traffic right there in three devices. Um, and you can, again, remote debug now and do all sorts of fun things. They're not black boxes anymore. And finally, uh, Adobe Edge Inspect is a great way to preview websites across multiple devices at the same time. So you have these three devices, rather than referring to them and refreshing your web page, check out Adobe Edge Inspect. Uh, Mixture.io, I think, is a, a kind of a newish service that does the same sort of thing. Um, and is currently free because it's in beta. Adobe Edge Inspect, uh, you need to have an Adobe client account or whatever, the cloud account, to work with more than one device at a time. So um, it's OK. I'm not really a big fan of Winery. It had a lot of, I had a lot of high hopes for that. Mixture.io is probably the best right now. Um, REST is another way of dealing with uh, responsive and performance. You can go through the deck if you wanted to. And some web performance tweeps that you might want to think about following. Definitely Ilya, Steve Souders, uh, Andy Davies would be my other top pick to kind of stay up to date on what's going on and what tweaks you can make. Uh, just in the same way that uh, responsive design is um, just new tools are coming out every day. Performance is just in the same way taking off and uh, has a lot of good stuff. So many thanks to Doug. I kind of ripped off a style he did for a joint presentation we gave last year for this particular presentation. And uh, questions? Issues? Yeah. You talked about setting budgets, mm -hmm. bandwidth when you start a project. Yeah. How do you sell that? Uh, I guess we're in the enviable position of just being able to do it. Um, it's an internal thing. We don't go to the client and say, well, we're only going to set this for you. I guess I should have said, what do you, how do you budget that and argue that against design? Who's going to want to throw in you know, 28 JPEGs? The wonderful thing is we have a lot of forward-looking designers who have bought into the responsive design and understand all this. We're just we're lucky, and i got to be honest. We're just lucky that people have bought into it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions I get asked a lot is, what's a good baseline? For, for size. Do you have any thoughts on that? The unfortunate thing is that baseline is going to be determined by the goal of the website. So like for emergency, we want to be like absolutely as lean as we can. Like if I could get it down to 20K, I would do it. And that's where like the designer was like, no, I'm never going to do 20K. Um, but we got to 50K, which isn't, I mean, that's still like teeny tiny. Um, and let's say you're doing like, I think like 400K, 450 is probably not a bad number. That's the, you get some good images out of that and you can maybe do a carousel, but at least you're at least doing something. It's at least a third of the average page right now. So that would be a good baseline for a, a .edu homepage? I would hope so, yeah. I, I don't think you should have to do much bigger than 430. I think we're in, our one designer for the carousel images has gone a little crazy with the safer web. So we're up to like 650, but I think you could do about 450 and, and be good, still get everything you want done. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, custom web fonts, is it yeah. better to download from a remote source or host your own? I would download from a remote source, let them, let the font foundry essentially always serve them out because they have the best like CDN set up usually for all that kind of stuff, so you're not thinking about all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, the one thing with web fonts I would say is I'm not like a huge fan of the Google web fonts. I don't think they have a great selection. But the one cool thing that Google web fonts does is let's say you have, you're going to use the web font for like a single word or like a sentence where there's only like 15 characters. You can actually subset down to those 15 characters out of that web font and make that web font that much smaller. Um, so you've got to like think about using very few fonts and understanding the weights that you're using and try to limit those as well, if that makes sense. But I really like web fonts. I think they're awesome. And uh, web fonts for uh, type. If you were in the adaptive images talk with um, Christopher, last one, like I, I, ICO Moon, ICO Moon, I can't remember the name of it. Is that what it is? Um, is a great service for delivering. Rather than delivering an image, you deliver the web font version of like the Twitter bird. Right, so that's a good way of doing it. Yeah? Is there any um, limitations about the size of cache across mobile devices? So, um, yes. But if you're being reasonable about it, you should never run into the, the problem. It's like a two meg limit. So you shouldn't have a problem. And if you run into it, then you're doing something wrong anyway. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah. I mean, the other thing that you find with um, mobile devices is really is RAM, so animations. It becomes a big issue, and, and how that stuff gets rendered out. Other questions? Yeah. We have a few suggestions in response to the, your, your example. If you're using a web font just for like a 15 character headline, yeah. I think it's font squirrel will let you encode just the subset of certain characters, and it's, it's actually like a bin text. Or oh, whatever. wow. It you, you can put it right into your CSS files. If it's just for a few characters, that's a great way to go. Yeah. And if you're building a device lab, and if you're part of a large enough organization, you probably have a relationship. Someone in your active group has a relationship with carriers. Yeah. And just hit up your carrier sales rep. They can give us a few of their phones. I'll probably loan it to you and forget about it. Yeah. Is that what you do with a few <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, there is definitely. Um, that's the one benefit about being an EDU. Um, and you can kind of fake out being a student, like Firefox OS, that kind of thing. Sometimes you can get devices that way. Um, and just make friends, follow people on Twitter, and talk to them, and they'll help you out. So definitely do it that way. Any other questions? I have no idea how I'm doing on time. Good? So I guess that's it. So thank you very much. Thanks for listening. <laughs>